Hi, this is Bob Harrington from Stanford University and Medscape Cardiology, theheart.org. Uh, today, what I really want to talk about is uh, this idea of how often does myocardial inflammation, myocarditis, occur in athletes? What should we be worried about uh, in athletes uh, who have had a COVID-19 infection? What are some of the screening tools we can use to, uh, to guide our recommendations and the conversations that we need to have with, uh, with patients and their families? And what are the latest data tell us about uh, what's the incidence, how we approach this, and how important is the question that all athletes wanna know they can get back to uh, doing the sport that they love and that they excel at. So I'm really privileged today to have with me my really good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Manesh Patel from Duke University. Manesh is currently the Richard Chan Stack Distinguished Professor at Duke. He is the division chief for the Division of Cardiology in the Department of Medicine at Duke, and he is the co-director of the Duke Heart Center. Manesh, it's really a pleasure to see you on the screen here, and I, I can't think of a better person to help with this, given your background of training both in clinical cardiology as well as in cardiac MR. Uh, even all the grief I used to give you when you were over in the, uh, the MRI scanner instead of the cath lab, uh, this is the time it's really paying off, isn't it? Yeah, no, thanks, Bob. As you said, when you said, think of no better person, I'm glad uh, there are better athletes for sure, but I certainly am trained in cardiology and MRI, so I can help with that. Yeah, they, they didn't pick either one of us to do this uh, discussion based on our athletic prowess, but more because of uh, me, because I'm willing to ask the question, you because you actually know something. But let, let, let's kind of frame this up, Manesh, and we'll do it in a, what I'll call a temporal fashion, because it's been in some ways a rapidly passing year in terms of knowledge accrual, but in other ways, it's been a tedious year as the, as the year gone on. But when COVID first came onto the scene last late winter, early spring, one of the things that I think a lot of us in cardiology was struck by is when we saw the early reports, case reports that were coming out on the cardiac involvement of, uh, uh, of patients who had uh, COVID-19. And now I'm gonna say, not talking about the myocardial infarctions that were observed, not talking about the strokes that were observed, those, that's something for another conversation, the thrombotic complications. I wanna to talk to you about the inflammatory complications, particularly myocarditis, which was, I think, something that raised a lot of antennas when that first appeared. What were your initial thoughts going back to last March when you saw those reports? Yeah, thanks, Bob. And, you know, obviously, we all realized quickly that COVID-19 was beyond a respiratory infection and that people were coming into the hospital and eventually having, at times, unfortunately, cardiovascular collapse. So we, we recognized that they were getting very sick and having cardiovascular collapse. And there were many mechanisms by which, at least biologically, we thought, certainly with a, something that binds an ACE2 receptor to vascular endothelium, it could affect the heart. And so those early reports, I think the first MRI study coming out of Germany that had over 100 patients that had left the hospital where they did MRIs and found abnormalities on MRI, which quoted, you know, 60, 70%. When that came out, I think two things happened for at least me. I, I looked very carefully at that study and thought, there is clearly some pictures and some people in here that have myocardial involvement. There were also several people when I looked at the, the images and other things where I thought, I couldn't tell if that's actually myocardial involvement from COVID. Is that something they had? They're 60 something and they've had cardiovascular disease that's unknown. And some of those, let's say, findings are very sensitive. So, you know, immediately there was a concern that there's myocardial involvement. And then the second was, how are we going to actually sort this out to help inform our, our colleagues and our patients? Yeah, and, and, and it's a classic issue in imaging of all types, but we're, we're focused on cardiovascular imaging here, is that what happens when you pick up stuff that you didn't know that you were going to pick up or that you didn't anticipate picking up? How do you deal with that information? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a constant thing in, in all of medicine and certainly in cardiology where I'll call it screening, screening for evaluation of some involvement. Remember, because obviously we understood in COVID that there were symptomatic and asymptomatic individuals. And certainly in that study, there were a lot of symptomatic individuals leaving the hospital. But this, as we get into the athletes, we'll start talking about how do you do, how do, you do evaluation in people that may be very high functioning and, and should you be doing screening, which is obviously a controversial topic. Yeah, and that's a topic that we want, we'll definitely come back to. I mean, I, I'm always telling the residents, the fellows that do not get a test unless you know what you're gonna do the results of the test that you're gonna get uh, because of this issue of dealing with things that might surprise you. And you know, as you pointed out, the Germany uh, paper was really a broad spectrum of patients, but then a report appears, a, uh, I think it was a letter to the editor um, from Ohio State University 
that pointed out in a group of competitive collegial athletes that there collegiate athletes that there was actually a high incidence of abnormal MRI findings on uh, on this group of athletes. Now, non consecutive, not great controls, a lot of the caveats that have to be applied. But again, that raised a lot of questions, didn't it? Because of the unique nature of competitive athletics, which involve very strenuous exercise and also a return to uh, exercise at some point. So let's let's again, deconstruct that one, Manesh. What did you think when you saw it? And then help the listener try to understand why would we care so much about myocarditis in athletes? Well, certainly, Bob, I, I think this is a really, uh, you know, this is the, uh, with a lot of things in COVID, this was the confluence of science, um, a, a little bit about the economy of how universities and, and programs must work, and then making sure we protect our our. our, our our, our people, our, our, our young athletes who may not always have protection. And, and I have to give tremendous credit to the investigators at Ohio State who published a research letter in JAMA Cardiology, rapidly um, agreeing to screen their athletes and evaluate those with COVID and doing a cardiac MRI study that raised awareness to say that these athletes were having abnormalities. And in fact, that original publication, I think, as you highlighted, had I think 26 consecutive athletes across multiple different sports. Um, that had cardiovascular imaging and, and demonstrated at least using something we call the Lake Louise criteria or some of these others where we look both at T2 and T1 weighted imaging just for those at home that's looking at the water content you know when you get infl inflammation and the cells in the myocardium might change how much actual cells and water contents there and then looking at something called late gadolinium enhancement where we give contrast and to see if there's actual um, cellular membrane damage or fibrosis and so what they identified was four out of those 26 individuals had findings that were concerning for myocarditis. And so that in itself was a, at least a, a higher possible rate than one would have imagined for COVID positive people. And remembering that these athletes, young individuals, as we've learned with COVID-19 may not have a lot of symptoms. And so that was important. And then getting them back to play, right? So we know that if somebody has in the athletic world myocarditis because of autopsy studies and others where sudden cardiac death risks exist, that we often want to have people, usually now remember those were either sudden death or symptomatic individuals where we know that we, we usually keep them out of athletics for three months or so to see the, how they return. Well, well, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, for our uh, casual listener, maybe not the uh, cardiologist who's thinking about this, but let's say the primary care doc who is uh, doing some, a lot of the screening for sports teams, both at uh, the collegiate level, the high school level, et cetera, maybe even younger. Why care about myocarditis specifically in athletes? What's the risk? Yeah, so th at least our understanding is that as the as the myocardium gets inflamed and and the cells themselves are um, let's say inflamed, that the myocardium may have two things. One is the ventricular function may change. So even though the person's actively exercising, their sympathetic tone goes up and down in these young athletes, and they may get an arrhythmogenic effect, and they may have something like a very scary sudden cardiac event that can lead to an arrest, and so. We, we, you know, that's the thing we fear most in athletic evaluations is, is there a substrate? Is there an underlying mechanism by which somebody could have an event? And when we, before COVID, looked at series of people that had certain cardiac events, somewhere between five to 10 to 15% of them might have had uh, myocarditis underlying it. And that's led to broad recommendations. How, however, as I've told you, you know, one thing we've learned with COVID and, and as we're learning with athletic evaluations is, uh, and there's a lot of opportunity. And I'll just say, partnering with some of the leaders in the field here that we'll talk about in a second, there's an opportunity to better define how we make these shared decision-making, both with collegiate pro athletes, but certainly parents and high school kids and middle school kids that we're all worried about and working about, including our, our patients and our weekend warriors that we deal with. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what really struck me is that, uh, you know, if you look at the AHA uh, scientific statements on myocarditis, it says that you should avoid strenuous exercise for upwards of a couple of months. Now, Manesh, that might be okay for you and I, we'll have to skip riding the Peloton for weeks to months, but we're talking about young people who love their sport, who are important to their teams, et cetera. So you wanna make sure you get this one right, don't you? Yeah, and I, I just highlight, you know, um, I've had the pleasure of working with Aaron Bagish at Harvard and John Dresner and Kim Harmon from University of Washington. You know, they've highlighted along with a bunch of other team docs and people at our own institution that, it's not just physically. Um, it's not just physically affecting our athletes who don't get to play. Obviously, there's a huge psychological effect on people who've trained and exercised their whole life. And then there's actually deconditioning. And we're also recognizing 
there may be things like postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome as you stop working and exercising in these young individuals that have an autonomic system that's pretty revved up. They have a volume issue that happens when you don't exercise. So now we're seeing post COVID postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So my sense is it's a very significant decision to hold somebody out of sports, just like it's very significant and I'll let them go to school. And so we really wanna be as evidence-based as possible. Yeah, I, th I think that that's really well summarized. And uh, that's why I say you, you definitely wanna get this one right. Uh, now, part of getting it right goes back to something you said earlier about the, um, the incidental observation. Uh, what I was struck after the Ohio State uh, report, which I agree with you, kudos to them for putting that out there. Um, but then several months later, we start to see appearing in the literature autopsy data, uh, including there was a terrific pooled autopsy study that was, uh, that was published that said, well, wait a minute, when you actually do, again, non-selected, because these are people who happen to have um, autopsies after COVID-19, the incidence of pathologic examination and, and, uh, and diagnosis of myocarditis was actually really low like nowhere near what the imaging might have suggested. Yeah, so just, you know, as often as the case, first reports, case reports, and as you get bigger, you get to the, hopefully the closer to where you might have the incident. So in, in the German study, it was some abnormalities on MRI and 60 some percent of the individuals, very worrisome, right? And the collegiate athletes who you would assume had no other baseline myocardial involvement because there are collegiate athletes, although some certainly have abnormalities, we know it was, 10, 15%, you know, 15%, four out of 26. And then you look at the autopsy series and you quickly get to less than 5% broader groups. And now you're looking at the gold standard. So some about the test you're looking at, some about the group of patients you're looking at, and then some about how you actually might think that incidence is. And we'll fast forward in a few and talk about some of the more recent studies. But I think what we know is that it, it, is, it is obviously something that is occurring. The exact rate of what it's occurring seems probably to be lower than those initial studies. But given the consequences, the, the questions have sort of focused on, okay, so what do you do to, to clear people and make sure that they're, they're okay to do some of these things because we want to be as safe as possible? Yeah, that, that's what I want to get into. Um, as you know, I'm an obsessed Boston Red Sox fan, and uh, many of the people that have listened to me for years will, uh, will agree with that, that I'm obsessed. But as you know, one of the Red Sox starting pitchers, Eduardo Rodriguez, was uh, held out last year because he actually had what sounded to be symptomatic uh, cardiac uh, event and uh, was reported as having cardiac involvement. I'm assuming it was myocarditis. They hadn't given us a whole lot more detail than that. What I'm particularly interested is, is he going to be back on the mound this year? And I'm going to get you to help me think through that right before we uh, exit the program here. So, you know, another piece of interesting data is that, uh, as you know, uh, with the AHA, we put together a COVID-19 Get With The Guidelines Registry. And James DeLermos and others presented at sessions with which you were the, uh, the vice chair, uh, the first report from the registry. And in that, which is mostly symptomatic or obvious uh, reporting in the EMR, what did we see? About a one and a half to 3% incidence of myocarditis in the, uh, in the HA registry? That's exactly right. And I think this is something we're going to hear over and over. If you, if you ask me, what do I think the, the actual incidence is going to be? It's probably going to be somewhere in there. And remember, these are very symptomatic individuals that were hospitalized with comorbidities that had Myocardial involvement based on echo and other findings, really well done, quickly stood up by the American Heart Association and found that the in incidence of, of myocardial involvement of some sort was around one and a half to 3%. And depending on whether you called it pericardial effusion, myocardial, you know, a variety of different definitions, but things that I would worry about for our patients. So the thing that I highlighted for you, I think, as we were talking earlier, is that, you know, we've learned these things in COVID. We don't know as well. The best I could find when I did the literature review for influenza was there was about 0.8 to 1.2%, Bob. So, you know, we haven't, uh, and that was out of a total of 800 cases. So if you said, what's the, what's the relative rate that happens when you have infections of any sort that can lead to myocarditis, right? But Parvo P19, a variety of ones have been described. So I think this rate might be higher given the mechanism. I think it is obviously significant because of all the other things COVID-19 does. And obviously, it is also so prevalent right now in our society that it matters so much. But, but I think that gives us a perspective. Now, the other thing that's worth thinking about is that the prevalence of myocarditis in individuals may be different based on whether or not you were hospitalized versus let's say you're an asymptomatic person, as we're starting to think about past or long COVID, who continues to have symptoms who may have not been hospitalized, there may be a prevalence in some of these younger individuals who have different immune systems. So certainly there's a lot of biology that we don't fully understand yet for this. Yeah. And your flu comment is so uh, spot on that uh, 
if you look at the point estimate and the confidence intervals that you just gave me and the point estimate and the confidence intervals of, uh, of COVID, they'll overlap given the state of the data today. And so one of the things I think that rightly people have been calling for, okay, is to make sure that if you're gonna do these long-term registries, we gotta have other groups, truly you know, non-infected people. We gotta have uh, people with other comorbidities. We gotta have people with other viral infections or just other infections. So there's still, as you say, a lot of unraveling the biology that we have to do. Yeah, for sure. And I, I guess I would say that the, um, it's both biologic and building these registries. So as I highlighted, I think um, some of my colleagues that I mentioned uh, have been working with the American Sports Medicine Group that has quickly stood up with Aaron Baggish, again, John Dresner and Kim Harmon and others, a group of collegiate universities, 42 or so that have participated in putting athletes data together. And with the AHA, I see that becoming a, a long-term registry of athletes that initially was started, of course, to answer the COVID question, but answer some of these others. What are the rates of abnormal things in, co in athletic hearts and how do you do shared decision-making for people that wanna participate in sports and how do we learn that from all the way from high school to older adults? And so I think that's a big step forward. And as you said, one of the things that we've learned in COVID also is what's the control group? <laughs> you know, How do I compare this information? And so we're also thinking about that for a study we're doing called Hearts of Athletes, where we hope to get athletic um, individuals who haven't had COVID and image them so that we have COVID, uh, control groups. And I know Vanderbilt and some other universities have also done this, had large cohorts of both athletes with COVID and without and started to compare those images to get to a, a better sense of what's, what's the abnormal findings. Yeah, and I think as you've rightly said as well, we're gonna get information that may well be instructive here for the, uh, the non-COVID related conditions because in the control group, there may well be issues that emerge. Well, well let's, kind of get to the last part of the conversation, and that is the most recent data that was published last week, also JAMA Cardiology. JAMA Cardiology has done a good job of, uh, of really pulling in these papers on the, uh, on the cardiac imaging issues related to COVID. And that was a paper uh, by, also by Martinez and colleagues. It included Aaron Baggish and uh, many of the other authors that you've referenced. Uh, and this is really focusing on a, a very specific group. These were pro professional athletes who were enrolled in protocols if they were infected uh, with COVID-19 that involved ascertainment of symptoms. It involved, as you said, the uh, the big three. Is that what you called it? The, uh, uh, the calling it. It's interestingly they're calling it the triple screen. You know, everybody the, the ER docs think of a different triple screen. My athletic colleagues think of it, but the, they they've sort of early on in the in the in the pandemic, uh, our our sports cardiology and our team docs and our medicine sports medicine physicians came together and said, you know, outside of symptoms an EKG, a troponin, and an echo seem like a good three tests that you would get. And if, if three of those were normal, what was the likelihood you were going to have something really abnormal in this person? And, and Matt Martinez, as you highlighted, and others have done a nice job of describing in, in the pro athletes across several different professional sports. Uh, yeah, again, sports right? yeah. Yeah, pretty impressive, right? You, you mentioned the Red Sox, but also has uh, hockey players, football players, baseball players, as you noted. So others. And uh, men and women, they identified that, the, again, the, the rate is like around 0.7 or so that have abnormalities. And specifically, that triple screen tended to do pretty good to identify those uh, who, who were going to have an abnormality. So gave some, hopefully, um, information to those primary care physicians and others that are evaluating people and trying to get both symptom evaluations and think about the testing we would do. Yeah, I mean, I think they really did a nice job that if you if you were minimally symptomatic to asymptomatic and you had a, you know a negative triple screen, triple screen, then you were able to return to sports pretty quickly as uh, as your quarantine period ran out. Um, but for those people who uh, had an abnormality on the triple screen, as you said, it was low. They did go on to MRI. And there are some of them who have evidence of myocarditis, but it seems much, much lower than the previous um, data might have suggested. Yeah, that's the thing about this. It's it's definitely lower, um, but you know, myocarditis is still pretty scary for people who've had the COVID infection or the SARS-CoV-2. And so, you know, I think for for especially younger individuals who are so functional at baseline, and certainly athletic individuals. I think the idea of making sure you get a good symptom screen and then making sure you get some evaluations valuable and same, with that same group of authors and others, as I've said, we've put together a fairly large collegiate example of trying to do this. And I think, you know, that hopefully that data will come out soon too, but we'll be looking at some of the same kinds of things. What's the testing? What's the constant long-term symptoms? And what were the number of individuals that had MRI findings? I also think the, the Big Ten has done a job of making sure they MRI'd everyone that was going back. So they're probably going to 
publish a, a larger a series that'll give us a better point estimate. But at the end of the day, I think the clinician's going to be wondering, okay, so I'm in clinic, you know, and I have this, the 16 year old high school soccer player come to see me and what, what should I do? And I, I think outside of understanding their symptoms, doing some of these tests that we just described as sort of ECG symptom tracking, and then maybe a echo. I'm, I'm not sure you have to do the troponin in that individual. It's not easy to get back. If those two are pretty normal, you should feel pretty comfortable for that individual given the data we have. If they are abnormal, then getting near a Near an MRI is not always easy. So thinking about how you, you coordinate that will be important. And then of course, when somebody has this or somebody's recovering from COVID without myocarditis, we do a lot of work on understanding their heart rate recovery and their ability to exercise to peak and, and those kinds of things that help us understand their physical ability. Yeah, I think that that's an important statement of it because a lot of what we talk about, even in the person who's had frank myocarditis is a graded return to exercise where it's very well monitored. It's slow exercise, gradually increasing the activity level, and that still may have value, and it may even have value in a formal exercise, um, observed exercise period. Yeah, you know, we've been thinking it broadly. You know, the reason I got into this is, is, is interested, as you said, you know, in MRI and other things, but just thinking about the number of people we were going to have leaving our healthcare system and people we're caring for that are going to have COVID, and how are we going to evaluate their hearts, and how are we going to get them back to doing the things they want to, sort of what I call return to play, return to work. How do you get people return to play, return to work? And that's why these athletic registries are so valuable because they're doing it very carefully and obviously importantly for these athletes who are, who theoretically, um, not that again, everybody has some baseline abnormalities, but they're gonna have less baseline cardiovascular abnormalities than our, our cohort of 50 year old individuals or 60 year old individuals that are in the hospital. So, so my, my final question, again, as you said, to help out the primary care doctor seeing a, a young athlete in their, uh, in their office, um, troponin is pretty easy if you're able to get it because it's either normal or it's not. Um, echo is pretty easy to get and interpret and, and you're looking for wall motion abnormalities. What should they be looking for in EKG? Yes, great point. And, and just to remind you on echo, you know, a certain number of these individuals had a pericardial effusion. So, yeah, good. so any, any little bit of a pericardial effusion might raise your awareness, uh, especially when you're thinking about pericarditis, myocarditis. So no pericardial effusion, no wall motion abnormality, pretty normal looking ventricle. You have to be careful what you start looking for because you're going to see thickened septums. You're going to be wondering, you know, do I have to start thinking about other diagnoses? So as you said, be careful when you order the test, you know how to interpret it. So asking your cardiologist to read that is important. And then an electrocardiogram, often you're a variety of things that go with myocarditis, pericarditis, but really, you know, what, what was done in these studies is just see any abnormality. We know that athletes have bradycardia, large right ventricles. They have things that will look abnormal on ECG. So you have to be careful there too. Early we, repolarization, et cetera. Early repol is going to be common, right? So we, we're not looking for that as much as significant changes that might be consistent with pericarditis, or if you are actually starting to see T wave changes that you don't think are associated with repolarization. Yeah, and the other thing I'm looking for is do they have any any evidence of heart block? Do they have a prolonged PR? Do they have Absolutely. Does their rest look a little longer than if you were lucky enough to have a prior EKG? Do it look that, as you said, the ST segments? But also, you know, is, is there any evidence of uh, of AV block? I mean, you want to be, I think, very careful as you uh, as you look at their EKGs. Yeah, no, that's another thing I think that we're going to get a, a fair bit of data. Hopefully, as these groups, like the ones I mentioned with American Sports Medicine Group or others that are carefully looking at the ECG using the athletic ECG screening criteria versus what's different in the COVID ones yeah. to say, you know, how do we screen? Because for a long time, there's been controversies about should you be screening athletes with ECGs or echocardiograms? So as we delve into that for our COVID, um, say, return to play people, I think we want to be cognizant of that available literature. Manesh, this has been a fantastic uh, conversation of a lot of information that's been gathered over the course of uh, the last year. And I think, as you've rightly said, we're still learning. We've learned a lot since last March, uh, still more learning to go. But fortunately, as you've said, people have invested in doing the right kind of research to try to understand this. And kudos to the professional sports leagues and the athletes who are allowing their data to be published so that the rest of us can learn from it. Because I agree with you. I think there's, there's something to be learned here that goes beyond the athlete or even if it's strictly confined to athletes, it's not just the pro athletes, it's the school, the middle school athlete, et cetera. For sure, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it and certainly really, really enjoy working with a lot of our, let's say team docs and sports cardiologists and then a lot of the foundations in the professional societies, both the AHA and American Sports Medicine that have taken the lead here and trying to make sure we go forward and figure this out.
Well, thanks, Manesh. Uh, my guest has been uh, Manesh Patel, the uh, Richard John Stack uh, Distinguished Professor, the Chief of the Division of Cardiology, and uh, the director, the co-director of the Duke Heart Center. Manesh, thanks for joining me here on Medscape Cardiology. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Bob.